International Dark Sky Parks. That's what we're talking about today. This is a supplemental designation that goes on top of a park's existing designation. So national parks stay national parks, national monuments stay national monuments, state parks stay state parks, etc., etc. They just have this added title as a signifier of what these parks are protecting, which is a resource that all of these parks share in common, but which is frequently overlooked. Dark skies. All about dark skies and dark sky parks coming up next. Hello and welcome to National Park Diaries. My name is Cameron and this is a channel dedicated entirely to telling engaging educational stories about national parks, public lands, and protected areas. My goal here is to make parks and park issues more accessible here on YouTube. And there are a couple ways you can help me out with that if you would like. First, all the YouTube stuff, the likes, subscribes, the bell thing, commenting, all the usual stuff that helps tell YouTube that people actually like what I'm doing here. That all goes a long way and is really much appreciated. Second, I do have a Patreon if you're interested in supporting me more directly. This channel is entirely fan funded and my Patreon goes a long way to making sure I can keep this thing running. There's lots of good stuff over there and I think you'll find a lot of value in it. So that's patreon.com slash National Park Diaries if you are interested. Now, let's continue on with dark skies. I first want to start by laying out why dark skies are important and worth protecting in the first place. We maybe don't often think of them this way, but dark skies are just like any other resource that a park is tasked with protecting. Light pollution is a problem just like air and water pollution, and preserving dark skies is important to both human and natural landscapes. Let's start with nature. For eons, organisms on this planet, humans included, have been adapted to the natural day-night cycles caused by the Earth rotating on its axis. Depending on where you were on the surface, the length of your days and nights would have changed, but still, by and large, you would have been adapted to some form of light and dark schedule. You've probably heard of this with sea turtles, which use moonlight to navigate back to the ocean, but many migrating birds use the night sky to navigate as well. In both instances, artificial light can attract these species off course and put them at greater risk for injury or death and thus inhibit that species' long-term survival. Then there are frogs and toads, which use the cues of the night sky to begin their mating calls. Artificial light disrupts this reproductive process, again threatening their viability. Think of plants and how reliant they are on cycles of night and day. Then, of course, some animals are completely nocturnal. They are active only at night. So that is when they forage, search for mates, avoid predators, raise their young, pollinate plants. This is when they live their lives. Our earliest mammalian ancestors would have fallen into this category. So in some ways, we have the night sky to think for our existence. It's only recently in our evolutionary history that humans have extracted ourselves from this natural cycle of day and night, as we've introduced more and more artificial light into our lives and made our relationship with darkness a thing of the past. And this is having adverse impacts on our health. See, our circadian rhythm, our own internal biological clock, is adapted to cycles of night and day as well. The onset of darkness is responsible for the production of certain hormones like melatonin, the regulation of our body temperature, and the overall maintenance of many of our body's basic metabolic functions. In other words, we require darkness to live a full and healthy life and the continuing intrusion of artificial light into these natural bodily processes is associated with increased rates of obesity, cardiovascular disease, depression, diabetes, and cancer, as well as decreased motor and cognitive function, as well as reproductive health. We can take a different angle and talk about this from an energy use perspective as well, especially in a time of climate change. 
artificial light, of course, uses more energy, and the way we use that light can lead to large amounts of it being wasted, 30% according to the International Dark Sky Association. We often put artificial light in places where they are not needed and use them at times when it is not necessary. The IDA also estimates that artificial outdoor lighting in the US uses 12 terawatt hours of electricity annually, enough to power New York City for two years. So yeah, we're just wasting a lot of energy by putting artificial lights everywhere. And finally, there's a more philosophical reason for protecting the night sky. The night sky is something every human being to have ever lived has been able to share. The night sky sparks a sense of awe and wonder. There's even a term for this, it's called nova lunosis. These are universal emotions and provide a common language across which every little kid who's ever looked up at the Milky Way can speak. In the United States, 80% of people will never be able to do this. So while we may be divided by geography, language, culture, and politics, the night sky is something that unites us, those of us living today and those who came before. It sparks a sense of discovery and passion and invites us to learn more about the world we live in and the universe we occupy. The night sky is a great connector. It connects us to ourselves, each other, and the natural world. But we're losing this night sky, or rather our ability to see it. Some estimates place light pollution as increasing at a rate of roughly 2% per year. And this is where dark sky parks come into play. All those things we just talked about are all problems that dark sky parks can solve. Parks, especially in remote areas, are the last bastions of the night sky. They're the last places where the true benefits of a night sky can be realized. So these are places where plants and animals dependent on night skies can thrive, where humans can go to rekindle our relationship with the dark to mitigate some of the effects artificial light is having on our bodies. Some studies have found that just two nights spent in a natural cycle of day and night can help increase your melatonin production. So yeah, that quick weekend camping trip is really doing wonders for your health after all. And that's all possible in parks that protect the night sky. But how does a park become a dark sky park? And how does one protect the night sky? Well. Light pollution, like other forms of pollution, is something that can be addressed, it can be fixed, and the International Dark Sky Park designation is one way of addressing it. The process of earning this designation is pretty involved too, because it has to be. Dark sky preservation requires a commitment to protecting night sky resources just like any of the resources a park protects. This isn't something you just get the slap on your social media profile and call it a day. It requires an independent third party certification. There are rules and regulations for that process. It requires an ongoing commitment to dark sky preservation, all sorts of stuff. Let's start with the certification. That is overseen by the aforementioned International Dark Sky Association. They set all the rules and regulations. They're a nonprofit organization and a recognized authority on light pollution. They're the ones who issued the certification in the first place, making sure a park meets the dark sky requirements, and they follow up to make sure the park is maintaining its dark skies properly. As of the time I'm making this video, there are 117 dark sky parks certified by the IDA. And again, this is not a replacement for a park's current designation, just something that is granted in addition to that designation. For example, Bryce Canyon is certified as an international dark sky park, but it is still called and managed as Bryce Canyon National Park by the US National Park Service. The IDA does not take over any management responsibilities or funding or anything like that. This is just a supplemental designation aimed at holding parks accountable for maintaining dark sky resources. They have a whole set of criteria for how to get and maintain this dark sky park status. I'm not going to list everything because again, it really is an involved process. So 
I'll give you an overview of how to become a Dark Sky Park, and if you're interested in the full thing, there's a link to some of the IDA's documents in the description. So first and foremost, you gotta have a Dark Sky to begin with. There is a base level of darkness that is required for a park to become a Dark Sky Park. That is just unavoidable. Like Central Park isn't going to be getting Dark Sky Park status anytime soon. Sorry, Central Park. Generally, this means you can see the Milky Way with the naked eye, there are no artificial light sources with significant glare, and there are these things called light domes, which is just like the sky glow you see around heavily lit areas. Those have to be dim, not widespread, and must be close to the horizon. The IDA does have actual like numbers and measurements that correspond with these conditions, like their measures of brightness and stuff, I'll spare you the details, again, they're in the description. Next, the park has to be publicly accessible. As much as the dark sky designation is about preserving dark skies, it's also about public outreach and public availability. The IDA wants people to be able to come out to these places and enjoy the benefits of dark sky resources in addition to protecting those resources. This means that for the most part, dark sky parks are, well, public parks, national parks, national monuments, state parks, public forests, things like that. Technically, you can have private land certified for a dark sky designation, but there has to be a commitment to public access. Also, in the spirit of public access, a dark sky park has to commit to outreach and education efforts for dark sky resources. Again, this designation is designed to increase public awareness of dark sky resources. So parks have to provide this element as part of their certification. This can include nighttime ranger programming, interpretive signage, social media posts, or anything else that helps inform the public, but it is mandatory for the designation. Then there's the lighting management plan. Yes, lighting management plan. These things are intense and heavily detailed, links in the description again. This is perhaps the biggest commitment a park has to make to become dark sky eligible. Parks, of course, will need lights around campgrounds, near visitor centers, places like that. So it's not about not having lights, but rather incorporating them in dark sky friendly ways. So that means reducing the overall number of lights. Uh, shielding is a big one, which just means covering the tops and directing the light downward instead of having it filter up and out for no reason. It could include timers or motion activation as well. Again, parks can have lights, they just have to use them properly. As part of the lighting management plan and as a contingency for their certification, parks must have two thirds of their lighting fixtures be dark sky friendly at the time of certification, plus commit to 90% within five years of certification and 100% within 10 years. Yeah, this is a big one. Artificial lights kill night skies and adopting a proper lighting management strategy is a key component for dark sky certification. And finally, this is not a one-time thing. You don't earn this designation and that's it. There has to be an ongoing commitment to dark sky preservation, which even includes incorporating dark sky maintenance strategies into the park's official management documents. This is a future-proofing criterion to ensure parks remain committed to preserving their dark sky resources. So as you can see, again, Becoming an international dark sky park is nothing to be taken lightly. There are strict criteria to be met, and parks must commit to dark sky preservation for the future. And there's a reason for this stringency, right? These parks are the premier dark sky destinations in the world. If they don't maintain their dark sky resources, we might not have many places left to not only go and view the night sky, but to learn about its wonders and experience them for ourselves. In this way, dark sky parks preserve and maintain dark skies, yes, but they do so in a way that allows us to reconnect to our roots as a dark sky species. Okay, that is everything I have for you about dark skies. Thank you so much for watching. Um, be sure to like, subscribe, uh, hit the little bell thing, leave a comment. Have you ever been to a dark sky park? Uh, I think the best dark sky park I've been to is probably Canyonlands. That area of Utah is just 
so empty and the night skies were so vibrant. Comment down below with your favorite dark sky park. Uh, and do be sure to check me out on Patreon if you're interested in supporting me more directly. And you can follow me on Instagram if you would like. That's where I post uh, channel updates, uh, pictures from my park adventures, uh, and it's also the easiest place just to get in touch with me. So uh, follow me on Instagram if you would like. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.